Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you. Looking back at your career, obviously 400 plus games, four flags. Is it a bit surreal to you to look back and go, wow, what a career? <laughs> Yeah, 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 it is because I think when you're a kid, you, you have a dream of, of playing the sport and playing at the highest level, like, you know, those people you see on TV, you some who are the idols, and that's who I wanted to do. I wanted to play footy like Gavin Wanganin and, um, and Michael Long, and, and you finally get there and you live out your dream, and, you know, I was still in the AFL system for 21 years and it goes so quick like the click of a finger. Hey folks, there's a wonderful event happening next year over the June long weekend. From June 7th to 9th, the Bali AFL Masters is taking place and the SA team will have men's sides in the over 35s, over 45s and over 55s. If you want to join in the fun, check out the Southern Slugs Football Club Facebook page. Well, what an absolute pleasure it is to have Sean Burgoyne for the very first time on Sports Legends with Bevo. Oh, can you hear me, Sean? Yep, I can. Yep, oh, sorry. Oh, I, thought, oh. <laughs> uh, I thought you were doing it like a warm-up. Uh, <laughs> Great to have you on the show. <laughs> oh, thanks for having me. So, <laughs> we're off and go off and go running now. <laughs> You're just in retirement mode, mate. You're that relaxed. <laughs> uh, well, I'm on holidays at the moment. Um, so, yeah, I'm Mr. Daily Daycare at the moment. Oh, right. So you've got a few kids you're looking after? Well, they're at school at the moment, so I do you know pick up drop offs and, and help with the lunches and that in the morning. So while my wife works, so oh right, um, a bit of house cleaning today actually. Oh, so you've done you've done the swap around. So your wife's normally obviously doing it's the other way around during the footy season, but you're you're sort of doing the duties now. <laughs> at the moment, yes, I'm trying to um, you know hold up my end of the bargain and do some stuff around the house. <laughs> Well, how do you go balancing, you know, family and also, you know, your busy life with, in terms of post footy as well with Channel 7 and everything you're doing with Port Adelaide Bergs? It's been an, um, an, a, a different transition for myself. I decided to transition and, and be over, over busy and not have any spare time, to be honest, with four kids, you know, working at Port Adelaide, working with Channel 7, some Triple M stuff, and um, I've started my own commercial cleaning business. Um, I thought I would overwork, have a nervous breakdown because I'm stressed, and then <laughs> and then peel it back a little bit instead of uh, transitioning into um, into work and then having too much downtime. And what do you what's your role with Port Adelaide? So I've got a, a couple of different roles at Port Adelaide. So I'm in the wellbeing space, so player wellbeing um, development. You know, part time development coach. So I'm the Indigenous Liaison Officer as well, and then a little bit of community ambassador stuff. So. There's a few things involved in there, but, you know, it keeps me involved in footy and um, out in the track a little bit and then also um, behind a computer at times as well. And it must be pretty special as well, still being able to stay involved with the game that you love and that you played for so many years. Yeah, well, it's been a good transition to um, transition out of the game as a player, but then stay involved in the game in terms of, you know, club land, you know, doing something I've been doing for, you know, I will... I was on an AFL list for 21 years playing AFL footy. So um, it's been a long time of my life, straight out of year 12 into footy. So got to transition, stay in the game, you know, not a trend in the game. You know, it's easy to talk because I've been in so long and I still love the game as well. And you mentioned before you've got commercial cleaning business now. Give that a plug and tell us how people can get involved in, in, uh, in booking you. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I've started an uh, Indigenous cleaning company. Um, so... You know, it's ACS Indigenous, so I, I thought of how can I transition out of the game and continually help, you know, Aboriginal people. I've been I've been helping, you know, Aboriginal players my whole career, uh, whether they be coming in the game, help them transition the game, you know, help them in the game, give them some, you know, some feedback and some tips here and there when um, I get text messages or phone calls to, to, you know, help them out or, you know, just give advice on transitioning out of the game as well. So I didn't want that to stop. So now moved into the community aspect where I think the, the best form of help I can help is with employment opportunities. So started a commercial cleaning business, ACS Indigenous, based in Melbourne, but we've 
we've got work in SA, New South Wales, Northern Territory and Victoria. So we've spread uh, pretty quickly over the last couple of years. Yeah, I've uh, really found it really fulfilling, to be honest, to help people um, with employment opportunities to provide income to to live life, better lives, to be honest. And hopefully I can grow a bit bigger and help more people. And speaking of cleaning, you've also got a partnership with OMO. Tell us more about that, Sean. Yeah, I do. So I'm obviously the uh, OMO Ultimate Footy Club Championship. So competition. So um, finding, you know, volunteers and club legends out there. And myself growing up in suburban footy with Mallee Park Footy Club, seeing plenty of aunties and uncles, part, you know, give their time, um, dedicate, volunteer their time to make sure the footy club you know, is, is sustainable and and can continue to operate. So finding out those club legends are out there with OMO um, has been, you know, a really enjoyable one, to be honest. So there's been thousands of people to enter the competition and, yeah, they've been out there, you know, shining the light on people who, you know, keep footy clubs and cricket clubs and all those volunteers who keep footy clubs a, a, a afloat. And who are some of the, the real interesting ones you met along the way and, and why do you think it's so important to have these local footy legends, Sean? I've lived and breathed it, to be honest, coming from Mallee Park and the country in Port Lincoln and playing and, you know, volunteers are the lifeblood of foot, um, of clubs, you know, amateur clubs, whether it be football clubs, soccer clubs, you know, cricket clubs, you know, volunteers are the lifeblood. They keep the clubs afloat. So I've met plenty of people along the way um, who have helped and myself going through that as well because you don't realise that as a kid, but Guernsey's mir miraculously after a game, they go away <laughs> and then they come the next week clean. You know, someone, there's always mud on the ground, you know, after a game, especially in winter, but then you leave the game and come back for training and the next day and it's 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 clean. So it's a great way for OMO to shine the light on those people out there who volunteer their time because, you know, they love their clubs. Now, well said, I was involved in, well, definitely not at your level, but played footy for 20 plus years and you just couldn't do it without those volunteers and the amount of hours that they put in are just remarkable, aren't they? Yeah, they are, you know, and, and OMO is wanting to shine the light and give those people the recognition they deserve. So when I was asked to be a part of it and, and help celebrate those people all across the country, I was jumped on board and we've got some OMO products as well, to be honest. So when I said this morning, I was just before I was, that I was doing some some housework, I was doing the washing, to be honest. So <laughs> I've got four kids. I've got two boys, two girls. We go through a fair bit of clothes here and OMO was good enough to supply me with some products. So... I try to do as much washing as I can and free up my, you know, and, and take my load off, take some load off my wife and, and help out as well. So um, it's a great product. I, I really enjoy it as well. So I uh, <laughs> couldn't be happier at the moment. And looking back at your career, obviously 400 plus games, four flags. Is it a bit surreal to you to look back and go, wow, what a career? <laughs> yeah, it is because I think when you're a kid, you, you have a dream of, of playing sport and playing at the highest level, like you know the people you see on TV, who some who are your idols, and that's who I wanted to go. I wanted to play footy like Gavin Wanganin and um, and Michael Long, and then you finally get there, and you live out your dream. And you know I was in the AFL system for 21 years, and it goes so quick, like the click of a finger. 21 years and all the things you go through, the highs and lows, all the injuries. It's all worthwhile to be honest, because you're living out your childhood dream, and then to play in grand finals because you play football because you want to be involved in a team atmosphere and you want to be a part of a team and then to experience success with a team um, is unbelievable and you get to celebrate with a lot of people and make lifelong friends and I was so lucky and so fortunate and that I got to play for a long time. And looking back at, you'll go, go back to 2004, obviously part of Port Adelaide's first ever premiership and I'm a power supporter, so I always remember that day, Shawnee. <laughs> but uh, to win it with your brother, though, how special. And uh, tell us about who led the aftermatch celebrations at the club. <laughs> yeah, that was unbelievable, to be honest. I'd, you probably remember, but, you know, 2001, one, two, and 3, we, we bombed out of the finals. And in 2004, we were coming up against Brisbane Lions, who arguably one of the greatest teams in the history of the competition. They were going for four wins in a row. They had Michael Bus. Michael Boss, who's run a Brownlow legend, Jason Akamanis, Brownlow legend, Simon Black, Brownlow legend, Jonathan Brown, one of the best big tall forwards of the history of the game. So we're coming up against a pretty, you know, a pretty formidable team that were a team full of warriors, to be honest. So to win Port Adelaide's, be a part of Port Adelaide's first ever premiership 
and, and beat Brisbane the Lions was something that you know I'll never forget. Obviously, playing with my brother Peter. You know, Byron Pickett was also won the Norm Smith Medal. Um, he lived with us for a bit um, when we first moved to Adelaide from my hometown, Port Lincoln. Gavin Wangany, one of my childhood idols, also an idol cousin, um, to play in that game with him. So there's so many special memories. And like I said before, to be part of Port Adelaide's first is something that you know, I feel truly blessed. Who are the guys that, you know, the real characters that were there probably more, than, you know, partying more than most? Or is that something you can't say? <laughs> have to keep them all behind closed doors. Well, it was fair to say, I think everyone had a crack um, after, we, <laughs> uh, after we won that first one. There was so much pressure on the entire team. Like I said, previous one, two and three bombing out. We got on the drink for a few days, to be honest. So, um, But it was just, a lot, to be honest, a lot of pressure that had just been relieved because... You know, to win that flag, we had an aging list, an aging team, and it was probably our last chance, to be honest, and we were able to succeed. But, yeah, we, we're we actually coming up for our uh, two, we're going for a 20 year reunion next year, 2024. Wow. So it's going to be almost 20 years next year, which is amazing to think that time flies. And you won the, the three flags at the Hawks as well. It must be pretty special. <laughs> <laughs> Again, well, I spoke about the, the um, you know, the heartbreak at Port Adelaide, a one, two, and three. We had some heartbreak at Hawthorne too. You know, in 2010, we bombed out first week of the finals. 2011, we bombed out in the prelim. We lost the 2012 grand final against Sydney Swans when we go into that game favourite. But then we win the next three where we go in an underdogs against Fremantle, Sydney, and West Coast, you know, and able to get a three P. So incredibly lucky, incredibly blessed. I played with a, a lot of great players as well. So, you name the players in Port Adelaide who are Hall of Fame members. You know, there's a number of them, Gavin Wangadin, Treaders, and a few others. And you can just go through the Hawthorne lineup. There'd be plenty of Hall of Fame members in there. You know, Mitchell, Sam Mitchell, Luke Hodge, Surioli, Lance Franklin, Joe Ruffhead. Um, no doubt they'll all go into the Hall of Fame. <laughs> um, so, again, and then to be coached by Clarko as well, you know, one of the greatest coaches to ever coach. Like I said, I... I feel incredibly lucky and blessed that I was in the right place at the right time. And looking back at your career as well, obviously there's a lot of talk about whether or not you should have stayed at Port Adelaide. And, you know, was there a feeling that you wanted to stay at Port and be a one club player or did you just feel in the end that you made the right decision? Oh, I definitely made the right decision winning, you know, three flags. Yeah, <laughs> um, <yep. laughs> uh, but no, it, was, it was one of those things where me, me and my wife, you know, we're, she's an Adelaide girl. Her father is a Port Adelaide Magpies legend, you know, we were um, in, firmly entrenched in Adelaide, but we thought it was going to be a great adventure and an opportunity to move to Melbourne for three years, to be honest, play footy, enjoy, you know, everything that Melbourne and Hawthorne have to offer and then move back. And those three years turned out to be 12 and three flags and, you know, made multiple friendships and, you know, um, plenty of memories. So, no, I definitely made the right decision. <laughs> and post-career? Did you consider staying in Melbourne or you, you mentioned before the family, you're always going to come back to Adelaide? Yeah, well, we'd, we'd always planned to be staying in Melbourne, to be honest. Our kids were in school and sports and all those things. And it's just funny how life turns out, you know, with, with the COVID, you know, pandemic that happened. And um, I retired, you know, during COVID, you know, Melbourne was in the midst of one of the biggest lockdowns in the world. And we just thought, well, why not move back to be close to the family and, and start life in, in after footy in Adelaide? And, um, my kids were happy to, to for the move, but yeah, who knows what happens in the future. <laughs> and you, you touched on it earlier that you're a Mally, Mally Pipe boy growing up. Um, tell us more about your, your footy journey, Sean. You're going towards the Magpies and then obviously going on to play for the Power and the Hawks. And who was some of your influences growing up? Yeah, well, I grew up and playing for Mally Park, the footy club in Port Lincoln, an all Indigenous team. You know, the players to be drafted at Mally Park is, you know, Myself, my brother Peter, Byron Pickett, Graham Johncock, Daniel Wells, Eddie Betts, Lindsay Thomas, just to name a few, to go on to play AFL. So I enjoyed footy there. I just wanted to, as a kid, to be honest, wanted to play A-grade for Mallee Park with my cousins and my and, and be like my uncles, to be honest. That's where my dreams lied. And then as you get a bit older, you start watching TV. And then I was like, well, I want to play AFL. And then we're in the Port Adelaide Magpie zone. So we got the invitation to come out and do pre-season in the under-17s and shift the cross at 15, moved out of home in with my brother in, in the city and started my footy career in the Port Magpies in the under-17s and then progressed and 
Um, as for influences on my footy, I'd probably say all of my coaches, to be honest. Mum and dad have always taught me to respect my elders and respect my coaches and whatever they tell you to do, you do it and don't back answer. So for all my coaches from under 10s in Mallee Park to 12s, 14s, um, 17s at Mallee Park to 17s, 19s, reserves and league at Port Magpies, they all had all probably instrumental in mentoring me and shaping me the player that I became once I was drafted into the AFL. And we know the, the record of obviously Choco and, and Clarko as well and you know, the real personalities of the game, but uh, tell us something we don't know about, about both coaches. Both coaches, oh, they're both pretty mad when it comes to footy, pretty full on. <laughs> you can see that. I, I guess when you spend a lot of time with, with the senior coach, they kind of become your mentors and, you know, um, help shape you the person you are because you spend so long with them for so many years they become very passionate about you as well and uh, they over time they actually become friends so very very lucky to have Choco when I started at Port Adelaide he was very tough on me um, his brother Stephen was actually my senior my league coach at Port Magpies when I was playing there so and Choco played um, footy with my wife's father Greg Phillips you know so he used to babysit my wife when she was a baby so there's a family connection there and I just got on really well with Clarko. To be honest, one of the reasons I got a trade to Hawthorne was because Clarko was our assistant coach at Port Adelaide for a few years and would do things like on my day off, would make me meet him at the Women's and Children's Hospital and would visit the kids in the sick ward and give out posters and stickers uh, because he wanted me to have an appreciation of how lucky I was to play AFL. And he wanted me to be, you know, just thank my lucky stars that I'm playing AFL and there's a lot more people worse off than me out there in the world so those things stuck with me and helped ground me as a person and as a player so uh, when I went to when I went to ask for a trade Hawthorne was the first team because I've had those bonding experiences with Clarko um, at Port Adelaide. Yeah of course there's, there's quite a bit of uh, similarities isn't there between Port and the Hawks in terms of coaches that have come and gone from from both clubs over the years. Yeah there's been a few well, well Clarko <laughs> was was there uh, for Port Adelaide a few years you know Damien Hardwick went across um, as an assistant coach, obviously now he's a, a senior coach his own right. There was also Andrew Russell, who was the head fitness coach at Port Adelaide. He went to Hawthorne and was, you know, instrumental in getting players, you know, fit enough to play the game and to help me enormously become the player I am today and, and shape how I think about the game and my professionalism. And so Andrew Russell, there's also a few players as well, you know, Brent Guerrero was one a premiership player uh, and there's a number of others as well. So there's a nice link there between them. And Channel 7, obviously, you, you're you involved in the, the commentary side of things with Channel 7 and Triple M. Uh, what's it like being in the box with some of the real characters like your Brian Taylors and your JBs and the like? No, it's, it's a great eye-opener, to be honest. Very nervous, uh, very nerve-wracking because it's a different expectation, a different preparation for the game. But but learning off those guys is, is a great experience. You know, everyone, when you roll into either Triple M or Channel 7, Everyone in there, even the people on TV, but the people behind the scenes, everyone's driven with the same goal to have a good production, to, get, to have a good night, um, to get off, you know, what they need to do. Um, it's, it's a real supportive environment and, um, you know, everyone's eager to help each other. So I've been really lucky to step into both the Triple M and Channel 7 team and have a number of people willing to help me. And it's very exciting because... You get a great seat, you know, in the house, um, you know, you, you would just enjoy every single game. And where do you see modern footy? Because obviously it's changed a lot over the years and some people say the rule changes have come, you know, for the better, others say for the worse. But uh, yeah, where do you see modern footy compared to when you were playing? It's different now, isn't it? Obviously that the rules keep changing. I would like to see the rules stop, um, you know, stop changing every year, year on year, um, just to get a bit of consistency um, to make it a bit easier on the umpires as well, because they're under enormous stress with the interpretations of rule changes to get it right every week. You know, the game's becoming quicker, faster. Players are coming in the game more prepared at, at, at 18 now. You know, it, it's a real fast, you know, game. And the players today hit in as much as they possibly can. I do like the fact the AFL have taken a, a real strong line on in the head and concussions, um, having doctors take control of that. So I do like the, the thought now that the AFL are putting a, a highlight, they're all highlighting an emphasis on 
protecting the players, you know, health. So I, I do like that. Um, who knows where the game's going to go, to be honest. I, I'm not quite sure. To be honest, yourself, what are your thoughts on the game? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, obviously, yeah, concussion's such an interesting one, isn't it? And I remember interviewing Rod Jamison, obviously someone you would have played against back in the day for the Adelaide Crows, and, and he was saying that in the future he could see actual players signing a wager before they play whether they sign um, before the season or whether they, you know, when they say new players to the club like new draftees or something like that, have to sign a wager saying that they're, you know, they're going to take this risk by playing the game. And it may, might be, you know, a, a quite a smart thing to do, Sean, because obviously we're seeing all these players and all these ex-players that are coming out and lodging claims about concussion and what have you. And yeah, it's a really interesting situation. And I, I, I agree with you. I, I like the fact that they're trying to do more about the head knocks and everything. But it's the thing that frustrates me, and hopefully it doesn't change, is that, you know, accidents happen in footy. And you, you, where do you stop? Where do you draw the line, you know what I mean? And the sling tackles, like, I think there's a lot of confusion with that as well. And I, I feel sorry in a way for the umpires because of these rule changes. And, and also, the yeah, with sling tackles, how do you know when it's a sling tackle or not? So what's your take on that? Yeah, I know it's, it's interesting. I guess when you play a contact sport, there's always going to be accidents. Um, yeah. But, you know, you can you can be hit from anyone. You can, um, in 360 degrees from all different angles, you know, the ball's an oval-shaped ball, so it can bounce differently. You have to twist and turn. So there's always going to be accidents where players are going to, you know, cop unfortunate hits, you know, and then the, which you can't prevent. The, the tackling ones are an interesting one as well because, from a lot of the tackles you see, players majority of the time aren't trying to hurt hurt the opposition. They're trying to tackle them. And because you're coming in at such a ferocious speed and you're tackling and you've got a strong mindset to tackle and not allow the ball out, it's very hard to, to turn off mid-tackle and not go to the ground. Or So that's the tough one for umpires to umpire as well. Um, but I think the more... Um, research that the, the club medicos do and the doctors do, the better we're going to be because we're continually finding out more. And I think if we let the doctors do their job and really show us the way, the game will be better for it. Um, but it is a definitely, like you said, a hard one for the umpires to umpire those, the, the tackling. Yeah, it, it's a real tricky one as well because, like you touched on, you don't want to lose... The, the traditional game of footy because it's such a great game that everyone loves to watch and you don't want to become like a, a non-contact sport like netball <laughs> but at the same time you've got to look after people's safety it's a real it's a it's a trick on i'm glad they're doing more at grassroots level as well in like local footy like i used to play in the hills and what have you now because i think that's really important too yeah it is well i think you know grass you know grassroots level it needs to be you know taken very seriously as well and i have my kids Footy. I've got two boys and two girls. Uh, my youngest is seven. She hasn't started playing, so she's eight. Just turned eight. <laughs> Got to get that right. Uh, <laughs> she'll she will play next year. But my 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 daughter Lenny and my two sons Kai and Percy, Percy both play. And whenever there's a you know a, a hit to the head or a really forceful contact, um, the medicos run out there straight away and assess, and they, they bring them off for an examination as well. Um, so that's really good to see. Um, the grassroots are taking it serious. And I want to ask you about Port Adelaide because there's been a lot of talk. Uh, I know you can't say too much because you work within the club, but there's been a lot of talk, especially on social media, post the finals campaign. And I mean, personally, I, I disagree with what a lot of people say about it anyway, because I think Ken Hinckley's done a wonderful job and been pretty unlucky, lost to your Hawks by less than a kick back in 2014 and obviously the Richmond game a couple of years ago. So there's been two times where they could have quite easily made the grand final. But where do you see Port Adelaide and, and do you feel as though they're, they're still right amongst that premiership window, Sean? Yeah, they've got an um, interesting, yeah, you, they've got that final hump to get over. They're making, they've made the finals, you know, obviously this year as well, and they fell short. That, that burdens, I've been in there those players. Um, I've sat in their seat. I've lost finals as well late in seasons where we haven't even made the finals, and it definitely burns, and it, it used it as a, a driving force for your next season. So everyone's pretty disappointed that, you know, the season ended the way it is. They did, but you've got to accept for what it, what it is. It weren't good enough. You have to value, you know, you have to review the season where you went right, where you went wrong, and, and try to improve. And I think the additions of, you know, Radigalia, um, Zerks Batcher, um, Soldo, and Sweet will be um, great additions to the team, um, especially the defenders. You know, the port have been a bit small of, of recent years, but I reckon they'll be great additions. And then 
you just look at the, the, the spread of players across the field, you know, um, Connor Rosie, back-to-back all Australians, um, a good year. Uh, Zach Butters won a number of awards, all Australian. Dan Houston, all Australian halfback. Jason Juan Francis comes in and has his first year at Port Adelaide. You know, um, Willie Rioli has his first year at Port Adelaide, has a career best year kicking goals. So they've got a number of good players across the field playing well. I think the window's always open. It just depends how you come back from the off-season that you didn't let yourself go too much. You have a good pre-season, that's all you can do. Is just rock up to day one pre-season, knowing you've, you've, you're prepared to start pre-season and you just do day by day, um, week by week, and then you get yourself ready for round one. That's all you can do. That's all every team does each year is is just rock up the pre-season and, and put the miles in and get ready for round one. Yeah, well said. I think um, the players being banged up as well didn't help the situation going into the finals campaign after those 13 wins in a row, did it? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you're always going to... It's pretty funny that always every club will be the same. At the back end of the year, rolling into finals, there's a number of players carrying injuries and it's just um, a fine line But when, when clubs and medicos pick players, if they are carrying injuries, can they still step out in the field and perform their role at a high standard or 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 do you take the option of, of not playing them? So there's a bit of a juggling, juggling um, act there as well. Most clubs get it right, you know, most weeks, um, but it's one of those ones where every team goes through those same situations. But you just got to get the job done when it comes to finals. Yeah, exactly. Certainly something you know how to do, that's for sure. <laughs> hey, before I let you go, just a couple couple more questions, Shawnee. Your toughest opponent that you ever played against and why? Toughest opponent? Oh, there's a few. Um, Jason Akamanis was always a really tough player to play on when I was playing in the back line. He was very good left and right foot, super quick, super smart, super agile. So when I played on him in the, when I was at Port Adelaide playing in defence was always quite tough. Cameron Ling was always tough to get a kick on when I was playing on ball. Would always um, challenge you as well. <laughs> um, a, lot of, a lot of respect for, for, for him and um, and then obviously at Hawthorne, I think there was, a, there was always a number of tough opponents. Um, I just enjoyed the rivalries, to be honest, more playing against Geelong, Sydney, Collingwood. They were huge games, you know, um, at the G, playing in finals against those teams as well. So I love the rivalries. And the best player at Port Adelaide and Hawks that you played with and why? Oh, best player. Uh, well, I can't go past my childhood idol, Gavin Wanganin at Port Adelaide. I used to go out watching Gavin at Essendon before he joined Port Adelaide, take hangers in the back pocket. <laughs> so obviously Gavin and then at, at Hawthorne, oh, it probably obviously have to be Lance Franklin, you know, modern day, modern day giant, you know, freak of nature. <laughs> you know, to do what he could do at six foot six, the speed he could run out, to have his endurance, to kick the ball 60, 70 metres, to, to kick over a thousand goals. Um, unbelievable effort in, a, in an era where forwards don't traditionally kick big bags anymore, and he's been able to do it over you know a large, a large chunk of time. And some of your funniest teammates at both clubs, and why? Funniest teammates? <laughs> oh, at Hawthorne, definitely Michael Osborne was a, a, the, cl- the club prankster. Super funny, super quick witted. Um, always, yeah, always had a one line all here. So I enjoy, enjoy catching up with him now as well because he, he, he's still pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> Michael Osborne's probably the funniest guy I've, I've played with, to be honest. And at Port Adelaide? Oh, well, probably I used to hang out with Byron Pickett a lot. Um, <laughs> and um, well, I used to room with Shay Cockerty. Very funny. I used to room with Shay Cockerty Collins in my first couple of years at Port Adelaide. And we used to room on interstate trips and Shay was very heavily invested in the WWE wrestling. <laughs> um, <laughs> he used to force me to watch it when we were in our hotel rooms before games or whatever. And uh, used to swear black and blue that it was real wrestling. Um, he was very funny as well. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> what a great way to finish. Uh, Sean Bergling, again, congratulations on your career, everything you've done in footy and uh, I'll make sure next year when I'm down there at Port Adelaide doing my MCing duties, I'll come down and say good day to you. And thanks again for taking the time to chat today on Sports Legends with Evo. I loved it, mate. Thanks for having me. Good chat. Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. 
I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you.